All right, we are recording. Okay, and uh, what is your full name? Gary Joseph Johnson. And the spelling? G-A-R-Y-J-O-S-E-P-H-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Okay, and we are at the Historical Museum of Bay County, and today is Friday, July 7th, 2023. All right, and because I have to, do I have permission to record this? Yes. Okay. And if you'd like for me to skip a question or topic, just say skip or come back to, and if you need a break, just let me know. And there's okay. more water over there, so. Okay. Okay, so uh, where, and when, where and when were you born? I was born here in Bay City, Michigan, at General Hospital on August 6th, 1946. Okay. And um, tell us about your um, your family in the area. Who are your parents? Uh, my parents were Donald J. Johnson and Mabel C. Johnson, and I was the only child in the family. What did your uh, parents do? Uh, my father was um, an internal revenue agent who worked for the government, and my mother was a housewife. Okay. Were there any um, traditional first names in your family? Not really, although Joseph, which was the uh, first name of my grandfather, my father's father, uh, that's been used as middle name, as my middle name, as my father's middle name, and one of our, uh, one of my grandchildren uh, also has Joseph as a middle name. So did you have any other uh, family members here in Bay County? Yes. Uh, I had two sets of grandparents. Uh, I had uh, one, one, oh, let me see now. At that time, I had two aunts and uncles that lived in the area, uh, and then uh, several others that lived, you know, in nearby cities, I guess. So, yeah, there was a fairly good-sized family here. Like uh, Saginaw, Midland, or? Um, let me see here. Uh, one was in Ascoda. Uh, that was my my aunt, which was my mother's oldest sister, Marie. She married uh, David Gilbert, who was a pharmacist, and uh, Gilbert Drugs is still operating in Oscoda to this day. Now it's my, my cousin, John, who's in charge of the business. So getting back to your parents, um, how did they meet? Uh, apparently, the story is that they met at a party and my father was there with a different girl, but he met my mother and there was, uh, I guess, some sort of instant attraction. They hit it off, as he often <laughs> says, and, uh, you know, they started dating soon after. And your, your father worked at... Um where did you say he worked at again? He was an internal revenue agent. His office was in the post office building on the second floor here in Bay City. For years he worked there. And then later on he was assigned to uh, the Dow Chemical case, as they called it. And he worked out of an office. Uh, uh, well, let me see. I, I guess it wasn't exactly in Midland. It was uh, closer, sort of in between Auburn and, and Bay City and a Dow complex out that way. Is this the, the Dow Corning? Could have uh, been Dow Corning building, yes. Okay. okay, I think you're right. So what did your community look like when you, excuse me, what did your community look like when you grew up outside of your relatives? Hold on. Well, I, I grew up in two places. Um, when I was born, uh, we lived in what was called the Little House. Uh, my, my grandparents, uh, Bill and Ada Hamlin, lived on the corner of First and Grant Street. And then they had a small house uh, next to their larger house uh, that was used as a rental. And so for my first little over three years, uh, we lived in the Little House. 
then my parents bought a house uh, on Rose Street in Bay City, and uh, I lived, you know, lived there from that point on until I left home. So growing up in town, um, as you went to school and made friends, what are some of your early memories of growing up in these neighborhoods or maybe friends you had? Well, uh, the neighborhood on Rose Street was a great place to grow up. There were lots of kids. I mean, literally every, seemed like every household, there were kids. And of course, I'm a baby boomer, so there were a lot of kids right around my, my age level. Uh, and at that time we, well, uh, there was, there were still lots around, um, where, where houses were not yet built, but were going to be built. And they were, they were like wooded areas. Hmm. And so, uh, there was a wooded area there on the next block that myself and my friends played in. It was, it was wonderful. It wasn't very big. But, uh, you know, it seemed big when you were a kid. Then about a block away from our home was the old Woodside School. You know, this was one of the old traditional uh, two-story brick buildings. And behind Woodside School was just a tremendous open area. Whether I think there were three ball diamonds. They even chalked out a, uh, a football field. There were no goalposts or anything, but just the lines. Uh, there was a tennis court, and there were baskets for basketball on the tennis courts. So growing up, myself and my friends, we were there continuously. Then there was another wooded area uh, beyond Water Street uh, to the north, and that bordered the river. And, of course, we were forbidden to go there because, uh, you know, afraid we might go in the river and drown or something. But... You know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, our parents couldn't see behind Woodside School, so we were in that woods continuously. There were vines, and, you know, you could build forts, and I was, it was a blast. So we spent a great deal of time there. If we weren't playing ball of some sort on one of those fields or courts, uh, we were back in that wooded area or riding bikes around. It was just, you know, so much fun uh, stuff to do, you know. There were a lot of uh, little mom-and-pop stores. Used to go there, hang out, you know, buy a bottle of soda pop, and you know. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was fun days. Any uh, any particular event or memory from that time period? Uh, you know, no real traumatic thing ever happened. Uh, as we got a little older, um, my grandparent uh, Joseph and Vera Johnson, they lived in a farm in Hampton Township and of course, Bautel and the Bobish. And, uh, you know, my grandfather worked during the day at Defoe Shipbuilding, uh, and uh, he was a farmer as well. They had about 16 acres. So when I was there as a kid, they had a chicken coop, uh, and of course, the, the dog and cat, and uh, even had a horse for a while. Um, so, uh, you know, in the barn, it was a blast to go in there, get up in the hayloft and, you know, run around and, you know. <laughs> uh, it was kind of an idyllic uh, life growing up, I guess. What, uh, getting back to your, your family, um, where did your ancestors come from? What is your uh, Well, history? one side of the family, um, the... Uh, Let's see, the Johnson family uh, came from the Netherlands. And uh, the, the real family name is uh, Janssen, which is spelled J-A-N-S-S-E-N. -S -S -E but when they came to Ellis Island in New York, um, it sounded like Johnson. And so that's what was written down, and we became Johnson from that point on. I, you know, back in the seventies, I was real interested in, you know, going back and and getting our real family name. But I know it would have been a constant battle because people would have always wanted to say Jansen, not Janssen. So, 
anyways, we didn't end up doing it. And uh, so I remain Gary Johnson to this day. Do you, um, do you know when, uh, and that was your father's side, but what about your, your mother's side? Well, actually, I, I can give you a little bit more information. Um, from my, my grandfather's side, um, uh, Aunt, Antoon and Antonia um, Janssen came to New York in 1873 from Elfen in the Netherlands. And apparently they had heard from another uh, Netherlander who came to uh, the United States and, uh, you know, the Bay City area, that there was a great deal of opportunity. And so uh, Antoon and Antonio came to the Essexville Hampton area with some other Dutch immigrants. And there are still a, a lot of, if you go into Essexville, I don't know how many are still there, but names like Van Ochten, Van, Van Ottingham, Van Warmer, all those Dutch names, that's part of the, you know, the heritage of, uh, of Essexville and Hampton Township. And it's that Dutch connection. And I, I'm not sure if it was because of the, you know, it's a low area, and just like the Netherlands, there, you know, he had to dig ditches and so on. And, you know, that was all part of kind of controlling the water and, and being able to farm. So anyways, that, that's that side of the family. Uh, my, uh, my mother's side of the family, uh, my grandfather, uh, Bill Hamlin, uh, worked uh, at the Bay City Times for 52 years. He was, when he retired, he was the... Uh, the foreman of the stereotype division. And this is when they forming the metal plates to do the printing. Um, his, uh, I guess would be his father, Freddie Hamlin, came to Bay City from Quebec in 1861. And then on my grandmother's side, which was the Brissett family, she was Ada Brissett, uh, they came from Hastings, Ontario, to Bay City in 1871. So, yeah, that's, uh, I'm not sure about how my grandparents on either side um, met, uh, but, you know, they were very nice. I mean, I loved uh, going uh, to my, uh, my grandpa and Grandma Johnson's. Of course, they lived on the farm, you know, and I had all that access to the animals and, um, you know, the fields or whatever, riding on a tractor with my grandpa. That was great, great fun. Uh, but uh, my uh, my grandparents, Hamlin, who was, when I grew up, of course, you know, just starting to speak, uh, I called my grandpa Old Pop. And I couldn't quite say grandma, so her name became Mama. And so it was real funny that as I grew older, and even my cousins uh, from my mother's other two sisters, they would call my grandmother Bama and my grandfather Old Pop. It just became their names, you know, to all the grandchildren. Uh, but they were great too. And, uh, you know, I just very nice. And, you know, having your grandparents right next door. And, you know, I was the only child. So, uh, you know, the benefit of being an only child is you get all the attention, right? The downside is, you know, you don't have brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, so that there, there's the, the negative angle, too. Are there any, um, any of those traditions still carried on today? Uh, well, I'm trying to think. Not really, because... Uh, what I remember about um, a, a tradition to my grandparents, my grandpa and Grandma Johnson out in Hampton Township was uh, my grandfather, my father, and my uncle going out and hunting pheasant. And, you know, there weren't many houses. It's not like Hampton Township today, which really is just like, a, you know, a neighborhood, houses all over the place. There were a lot of pheasants out there, a lot of open land, 
And, uh, you know, they would usually uh, shoot a pheasant or two. And then we would have uh, pheasant dinners at my my grandparents. And I can remember sometimes, you know, getting the, <laughs> the bird and there would be buckshot. You know, it, it's still in some of the meat that have been cooked. And it to pick the buckshot out of there. Um, but I remember my, my grandmother, Johnson, was an excellent cook. And, uh, you know, she loved, she had a sweet tooth, so there was always a lot of pies. And uh, she made a killer lemon meringue pie mm -hmm. and tarts, you know, with the, the leftover dough with the jelly in it. So, you know, always lots of treats around. My grandmother, Hamlin, um, she had this recipe for a meat pie that's hard to describe, but it was so good. I, I think uh, my wife Lynn still has the recipe, but it's, hmm. you know, and it's, there's quite a lot of different kinds of meat that have to be grinded up and so on. But that was always kind of a traditional Christmas offering uh, that my grandmother would make the meat pies. Uh, probably a French recipe from back in Canada, I'm guessing. I don't know for hmm. sure. So um, you mentioned you were an only child. So what um, what games did you play when you were young, or what toys did you have? Or? I I was big into uh, I what you'd call them figures. At least that's what I would call them. It'd be like toy uh, cowboys and army people, and you know just making up stories and you know as you're playing with them, fighting battles and so on. There's a lot of that, and. Uh, uh, I had one of uh, the what I think is one of the first interactive uh, television games, and it was this little animated show called Winky Dink. And if you bought a Winky Dink uh, set or a game or whatever, it had a plastic screen, and so when you're watching Winky Dink, you had to put the plastic screen on the front of the television. And then you had a series of crayons. And so as Winky Dink was going through his various adventures, sometimes he needed a ladder to get away from the bad guys. So you would take your crayon and you would draw the ladder on the screen so Winky Dink could climb up the ladder and get away from the bad guys or whatever it is. And, you know, you would, they gave you, you had a cloth and you could wipe it off afterward. And, uh, you know, next week for the next adventure, you would have your little <laughs> thing that you put on the screen. Uh, so that's one that, that sticks in my mind. But there were various other board games, you know, that you play with your friends and so on. You know, checkers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. A lot of games where you're spinning something and moving uh, a piece around the board, uh, that kind of stuff. Any, um, do you have any, like, really good neighborhood kids that you were friends or best oh, yeah. friends with? Like we a, had, there were four of us, uh, Tim Lavasser, uh, Tom Burt, and Jack Wiesen. We were all around the same age, and we were always together. And so uh, a lot of these games I'm telling you about, uh, we would do, uh, you know, a lot of sports games, which, you know, aren't very sophisticated to young people today. Uh, electric football. You had this board, and you'd set up the little players and turn it on, and the, the field vibrated, and the players would kind of move forward. You know, it's pretty, uh, pretty primitive. An electric baseball, where you would, uh, you know, you would, uh, you had a baseball field, and um, there was this little pitching arm that that threw a wooden ball that had a magnet on it, and then there was a little bat, and so one person could sit behind and push the button, and then the other person would let go of the bat when the ball is coming that way. And then the ball would, if you hit it, would travel out into the metal field. And, you know, if it's stuck on one of the fielders that, you know, was a ground out or a fly out, or sometimes you could hit the ball over the, the fence, that would be a home run. You know, again, uh, all very primitive the hockey games, uh, same kind of thing. You could manipulate the the players, the metal players, and the shoot a puck. Or uh, when the first games actually used a marble, and then as it went on, it came to a puck, and you could you could actually move the players back and forth. And the original games, the players were stationary, but you could spin them around and 
really whip that marble around at, at, at high rates of speed. So that was a lot of fun. And that's the kind of stuff that we did together. Any um, any hobbies growing up? Oh, collecting baseball and football cards was real big. Uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, a, a kind of almost some, sometimes a competition with your friends to see if you could get the whole checklist of players. Uh, so I still have those baseball cards and football cards. I'm sure they're worth a fair amount of money. Uh, starting in 1956, uh, I got very interested in rock and roll music. And so uh, that was that was a big thing. I, I still have some of the 78s because I didn't have a 45 player. I just had a little Victrola. And uh, so I have those and then eventually got a 45 player and purchased 45s and with my paper route money. That was my, my big first job was uh, delivering newspapers. But, you know, it didn't make a great deal of money, but you could make eight to ten dollars a week when I was a kid. That was pretty good. And, you know, you could go down to Lucky's or whatever and buy a couple 45s and you know, all the other things that kids like. So as you got older, you, you got into rock and roll music. Um, this would have been like in uh, high school, middle school? No, or? this was uh, I was nine years old when I first saw Elvis Presley on television and uh yeah it was just i didn't see anything like that and uh so that kind of started it and then when i went to uh, when i switched schools um that would have been i'm in the fifth grade i started going to saint joseph grade school in bay city I, my first five years i was at woodside from kindergarten through fourth and uh the kids, both high school and grade school at uh, St. Joseph, would go to Stevens Dairy. It was a block away from school. And, you know, the high school kids, we'd go over there, and the high school kids would be playing the jukebox. And so that kind of opened my eyes and ears to a lot of different things, um, you know, what the high school kids were listening to. And, you know, you know gave me music that I liked and, uh, you know, would go out and buy. So, and that continued right through high school. You know, Steven Sterry was the big hangout. You know, after a, a football game or a basketball game, everybody would go to Steven's. And, you know, like Cokes and ice cream and burgers and French fries. And it was really a cool place. You know, and it was very similar. Uh, Bay City actually had a lot of city dairies in different neighborhoods. And so I'm sure kids that lived on Columbus and, you know, in, in Essexville, I, I know actually we had another one, the Woodside Dairy, um, that was really closer to me than, uh, than Stevens. But, you know, Stevens was right next to school. But the Woodside Dairy was another place where we would hang out. They had a pinball machine, a jukebox, and, you know, a little bit of room where you could sit down, have an ice cream cone or a malt or something like that. So that's the nice thing about growing up are those dairies and as, as well as the mom and pop stores. And they welcomed kids. You know, it wasn't like the kids were a, a nuisance or anything like that, although we probably were. Uh, it, you know, uh, we were spending money there, and I guess that made them happy. Um, so getting up into uh, grammar and, and high school, um, Let's talk about that era. What were there any subjects that particularly interested you? I was always I always liked history, and that was probably my my favorite subject in school. Um, but you know, I wasn't a real good student. I I just wasn't real interested <laughs> in academic achievement. So, <laughs> um, any uh, any influential teachers? Uh, well, not really. Uh, I mean, there were some teachers I liked better than others. We had a, a, a nun at, when I was in high school called Sister Agnes Clare, who I, I, my, I, when I think about her now, I, I, I'm reminded of Darth Vader. That's, um, you know, she just had that kind of um, image, very controlling, very strict, didn't care for her at all. But I did have her as a teacher, 
and she was a very good teacher. Uh, and so I, I guess I, I could look at her as much as I didn't like her personally. I did admire her uh, skill as a teacher. She was good. It kept you interested. And, uh, you know, there were some, she had some projects that I really enjoyed working on with her that, uh, but, you know, it, it was just the start of technology. And I'm thinking maybe our senior year, uh, we had a, a television class that was produced at Central Michigan University. And it was, it was a history class and I enjoyed that. And I remember that's the reason that we knew when John F. Kennedy was assassinated because we had televisions in our classroom. And I remember Sister Agnes Clare coming in and saying the president has been shot. And it was just something like, that's something, and I'm sure it was not only myself, but um, any kid my age, you couldn't even conceive of that was something that happened in history to Abraham Lincoln or something like that. But in 1960, that that would never happen, that a president would be assassinated. So it was a real shock. And I remember, you know, a lot of, my, like my wife, they, they sent the kids home from school. We stayed in school. In fact, we had basketball practice that night. And we were talking about it. I can remember sitting there, you know, before practice was starting, we were just shooting around and so on, you know, talking to my friends and just, it was just like, wow, uh, you know, President Kennedy's been shot. Um, well, yeah, it was, I was really, I would never forget that, you know, just like you say, you always remember where you were when Kennedy was shot or you always remember where you were at 9-11 and yeah, so certainly. What was, um, what was town like? when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Do you well, remember what was the, the general well, around town? What was that? I, I, you know, I wasn't downtown. It was just sort of like everybody was home watching television. And of course it was the television was on when Jack Ruby was, you know, uh, shot Lee Harvey Oswald. So, I mean, man, you talk about a, a, a weekend or a, a few days where some some very major events happened. Uh, that would be right then. Um, were you, uh, other than basketball, were you involved in any other organizations or No, clubs just or sports. sports? Uh, I worked on the yearbook in my senior year. I was a sports editor of, our, of the yearbook. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Um, but no, nah, I wasn't really a big joiner of organizations, anything like that. We're just, you know, it's been a little bit of a loner, uh, uh, more content to just hang around with my friends and so on. And, uh, uh, did you have any goals or dreams for yourself when you were? Actually, when I was in, in school, I, that's when I first thought about being a teacher. I'm sure Sister Agnes Clare, as much as I <laughs> kind of hate to admit it, uh, may have inspired me to a certain extent. Hmm. As well as a couple of coaches, actually, this uh, coach, uh, Kellerman, was, uh, yeah, he was pretty good in the classroom. And I remember other, our, one of our other coaches, you know, was just like, uh, you know, shut up and read the book. That was... <laughs> 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 Not exactly dynamic in the classroom. What? Um, so getting back to uh, the family dynamic, what um, what holidays did you guys celebrate? All the traditional ones, and it was usually just like a get together, a dinner. Um, you, everything centered around a dinner usually, and it would be, you know, either at, at least initially, it was always. Um, at one of my grandparents. And I should have mentioned, uh, probably another person who was very influential was my aunt, Viola Rellin. She was a teacher, very, very highly regarded teacher in Essexville. And the uh, Viola Rellin uh, Elementary School is named after her. So, holidays, getting back to that, what <coughs> Excuse me. Nope. Went down the wrong way. 
You okay? Let's take a break here and get my voice back. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so we're talking about holidays? Mm -hmm. your, uh, your favorite part of the holidays, girl. Well, of course, at Christmas was getting presents. I mean, you know, <laughs> couldn't beat that. Uh, the excitement, uh, you know, when you were a kid uh, was about as high as you could possibly get waiting for that day. And I, you know, trying to find that presence where my parents might have hidden them and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, pressing the paper and see if I could read, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what was under there. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, Christmas was the biggie. But Easter, you know, it was it had an Easter basket. You know, he had to find the Easter basket. That was always a fun night. And, you know, Halloween, you're going out with your friends and trick-or-treating. It was always a blast. Uh, you know, birthdays, I always look forward to those. That was a big deal when you were a kid. Um, so your, uh, your community, um, you mentioned you moved, you lived in a couple houses growing up. Um, have have you noted any changes in that community over time as you grew up? Well, uh, when I was, when I grew up in, uh, in Bay city, um, almost all the houses of my friends, their moms were home. It was, I, there was a couple where the moms had a job. One was a waitress and one was uh, a salesperson at, at one of the uh, women's clothing stores. But just about everybody else, the moms were always around. Uh, I'm sure that's very, very different today where, you know, both parents usually have to work to make things go in the family. But that was just like, it was very secure. You know, there was always just something happened and there was always a mother nearby that could, you know, somebody got a bad cut or, you know, her fell off a bike and hurt themselves that, you know, mother would, would step right up and, you know, take charge of the situation. But in terms of the houses, I could go down to the, you know, that Rose Street where I grew up and all the houses that were there when I was a kid are still there. Has not changed one bit. Hmm. Um, so, back into the household. So, your mom was a stay-at-home mom, right? Housewife. Um, was she the one that prepared all the meals? Yes. And what were those like? Was there a particular diet you guys had? Or? No, it was typical American fare. You know, meat, potatoes, vegetable, maybe a dessert sometimes. Um, yeah, nothing out of the ordinary, not a whole lot of ethnic foods. Uh, we never ate Mexican food. I, I didn't taste Mexican food and so yeah, I don't know. I think it was a frozen dinner or something. I tried it, you know, probably when I was in high school. Uh, Italian, uh, spaghetti, chop suey. Uh, other, you know, other than that, it was all pretty traditional American fare. Um, same thing, pizza. I don't think I tasted a pizza until I was, I don't know, probably eighth or ninth grade or something like that. And I mean, you think, geez, pizza is such a staple, you know, of, of uh, life today. That, uh, but yeah, it was different. It was very different. There weren't a lot of pizza places around either. You know, there were like a, a Chef Boyardee pizza mix, so you could make it at home. It was pretty weak, uh, but. What about uh, cleaning up after meals? Uh, you know, it's pretty much my mother did that. You know, I did, you know, I, I kind of did the outside stuff, you know, cut the grass and, you know, help my dad out in the yard. You know, it was, it's very, you know, there were like, it was a time of more like traditional roles. Uh, and that's just the way it was, you know, he didn't, didn't see much variation from that in any, any of the households. Um, any pets growing up? Oh, yes. I had a pet terrier, Coco. My buddy, you know, Coco was a great dog, very smart. And, uh, yeah, it was fun. I loved it. And I took care of Coco. You know, that was my job. Okay. So 
about um, clothes? Let's see, where did you, where would you get your clothes? You, uh, you know, when I was a kid, it was just like the clothes appeared. <laughs> My parents <laughs> bought everything and I would just wear whatever they put in front of me, basically. It wasn't until, uh, you know, I got, you know, maybe junior high, high school that, oh, hey, you know, <laughs> I'd like to have some say in what I'm wearing here. <laughs> <laughs> and then around that time, would you go shopping here in town for your own? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there were all kinds of places you could shop. Neps and, uh, you know, they had a, a couple of uh, men's clothing stores. There were some pretty good things in there. Um, I would say, yeah, that's, uh, there was Sears, uh, Robert Hall, uh yeah, there were there were quite a few, you know, men's clothing stores that also had boys wear, and then there were you know quite a few women's stores and you know for girls wear as well in town. Yeah, the downtown was very vibrant. There was all kinds of uh, retail places around uh, back in the fifties and sixties. A lot of theaters all over the place, neighborhood theaters. We had the Woodside Theater, uh, which was you know, several blo blocks away from us. Uh, you know, and they catered primarily to a young audience. They would have double features. Uh, you know, the Bowery Boys, Abbott Costello, Martin Lewis, a lot of comedy stuff. I saw my first uh, Elvis movies there. Um, you know, Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, so... Getting around town, uh, did you guys have a family car or use public we, transport? We had one car. Uh, there was some public transport, but I, I never took it. You know, we walked or rode our bikes everywhere. And how it was about same going to school? We always rode bikes or walked to school. Was there a school bus in there those days? A uh, nap for St. Joseph. Hmm. Um, you know, and it was only a mile, but they never called school, you know, in the wintertime. So I, I came to school a number of times. I was soaking wet by the time I got there, you know, but I just, the school was never called for weather. The entire time I was in grade school and high school, we did, we did not have a snow day. <laughs> Were there ever days where you had school, but the public schools didn't? Um, because of the weather? No, I don't think the public schools ever called school either. Uh, you know, they certainly, I went to public school for five years and we didn't have any days off that I ever remember. And, uh, you know, same thing in St. Joseph. And there were some days that we had off that the public school didn't, holy days. Uh, so that was always nice. Um, so family car again, uh, was this your father who would drive yeah. or both your parents? Yeah, my mother was in a car accident when she was younger and never drove. I don't know. So she would take the bus sometimes downtown to go shopping. Uh, but sometimes she walked as well. You know, she was in good condition. And, uh, um, family vacations in the car, road yes. trips? Yeah, uh, you know, my dad was uh, was a great enthusiast of going to historical places. So I got a chance, you know, go to Washington, D.C., Gettysburg. Uh, we had trips up north. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of family vacations. And he continued, uh, you know, after I was in college, he and my mother would uh, often, you know, go down to South Carolina in the winter months for a month or two. Um, you know, they traveled around quite a bit, traveled out west, uh, you know. Um, and how about your first car? Do you, do you have a memory of first learning to drive? I, I, yeah, I learned to drive in high school and uh, I got my first car after graduation. And that was uh, a hand-me-down from my dad. It was a Dodge Dart. And it, the Dodge Dart, the big thing, it was push button. 
automatic transmission. So that was my car when I was in college. Unfortunately, when I was at Central Michigan, I totaled it. <laughs> oh, what's that story? I just went to the grocery store and uh, I was heading back to my apartment and I didn't see, somebody was in the left turn lane and I didn't see an oncoming car. And when I turned, I got hit by the oncoming car. I didn't get injured, but it sure messed up my dead start in a big way. <laughs> it was never the same again. <laughs> Did you, uh, were you able to find a replacement? Uh, yeah, yes, I needed a car. And so uh, my dad uh, actually gave me uh, uh, another car. And he got a new one. He, you know, he loved his car. So, uh, yeah, I got that one because I needed to be able to get around and, in, uh, you know, get home and do student teaching and all the other things that uh, were part of my education at Central Michigan. Um, so, what sort of entertainment do you like today? Hmm. Then and now. Well, I was a big movie fan, and. Uh, you know, so went to a lot of movies, uh, you know, when I started dating, that was usually, you know, part of the, the dating procedure, going to a movie and then going out and, you know, getting something to eat. One of our big favorites was Terry and Jerry's. Uh, and they were very accepting of high school kids coming in and you could get a cheese pizza really cheap there. And, uh, you know, the waitresses and everything always, you know, were very friendly, kind of made a fuss over, you know, they got to know you. Um, yeah, that was always fun to go there. Let's see. Uh, did you have a family doctor growing up? Yeah, it was, a, it was a doctor by the name of Dr. Foster, and he did house calls. And I remember him very distinctly coming into our home when I was sick and uh, you know, checking to make sure I was going to survive this thing. How did that go? Yeah, it went good. He was a very elderly gentleman. Uh, you know, he looked older than my grandparents. So, and after that, uh, I think after Dr. Foster must have retired, uh, I don't ever remember another doctor coming to the home. So I think that around that time, that was kind of being phased out where a doctor would actually come to your house. So, What was the illness you had again? Pardon? What was the illness you mentioned you had? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember. I, I had um, a very serious infection. It was a gum infection when I was a kid. It's called trench mouth. Mm. Oh, that was bad. And I'm, I'm trying to remember what grade, I think it was kindergarten. And I missed a lot of time uh, for that. I was, um, I was pretty sick. And so I think that's what he came home to treat me with. What causes trench mouth? It's a, it's a bacterial infection of some sort. And it might may start in the gums or something like that. I'm not sure how I would have contracted that. Um, but yeah, it was bad. Um, any home remedies for any illnesses or sicknesses? Oh, my, my mother was a big believer in Vicks. So, you know, if you had a chest cold, you know, rubbing Vicks on it. Uh, another favorite was uh, taking a cloth or a rag, heating it, and putting Vicks <laughs> And again, the, the cure all, and uh, you know, wearing that on your neck when you had a sore throat. <laughs> I actually used a lot of Vicks. We didn't get the the chicken noodle soup. That was that. Oh, well, although Verner's, Verner's ginger ale, that was another uh, uh, cure all. I, I enjoyed that one. I'm a big fan of Verner's ginger ale. So, that if you're going to get sick and you can have some Verner's, okay then. Although it was usually warm burners, so yeah. not quite as good. Um, how about your uh, your first job? Uh, my first real job was as a paper boy. And 
my friend Tim and I, uh, our first, uh, we had a, um, a route that was um, a combination Detroit News, Detroit Times. It was the third Michigan paper back then in the 50s, and uh, or uh, third Detroit paper. And, you know, it was really a lousy route because we had, um, I think, 15 or 16 daily and something like 130 or 140 Sunday. And the Sunday paper at that time was about this thick. It was gigantic. And I can remember as little guys, I think we were, you know, maybe in the sixth or seventh grade, trying to pull, you know, they were so heavy. We had, you know, like your little metal wagon, you know, the radio flyer, whatever it was. And, you know, just trying to tug these, these papers down the street, you know, and setting the paper on the porch. And then we would, you know, again, it didn't make much money. I think uh, probably we would be mostly get paid like at the start of the month when we collected. A lot of people would pay by the month, you know, like 40 cents for or 50 cents for the month. And we'd collect then. And that was their big payoff. Split it, and I think we'd get like four dollars a piece, and uh, you know, go down and spend it on that 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 weekend on some Hardy Boy books or uh, records or something like that. Uh, so we weren't. That was bad. We we didn't last long on that one. We just figured it wasn't worth the uh, you know the effort that you had to put in on every Sunday to do this. So the big the prime paper route was the Bay City Times route because it was in a very small section. Literally everybody got the Bay City Times. So if you had a route, you could get a hundred customers in probably a three or four block area. In this Detroit news and Detroit Times thing, well, this was spread out all over the place. We were tracking out you know, into areas that, you know, we <laughs> would never go hang out or anything like that. Uh, but Bay City Times, you know, you could, uh, we had it down. Uh, you would you would get your, your bundle with all your papers, take it home, snip it open with your wire cutters, and fold all your papers. Or later on, it was even easier to do it with a rubber band, stick it on your bag, and just go down the street and was just like reaching into your bag and flipping a paper onto the porch. And you know, you get really good at it. And if you missed a porch, of course, you'd have to stop and get out and put it on the porch. But, uh, you know, that was, you, you got pretty good at it, you know, and you didn't miss too many times. And you could get, you could run through that route and deliver all those papers in, you know, under 30 minutes. How long did you work there? I had it for four years. I mean, it was a good job. Uh, when I graduated from school, I gave up my route. Former Mayor Tim Sullivan took it over, and uh, I got a job at Ray's Food Fair. And, you know, it paid, I think at that time, probably getting about a dollar thirty an hour or something like that. And, you know, you were the carry out, you stock shelves when needed, you, you know, whatever they needed a kid to do, sort the bottles, whatever you did that job. And then uh, I got a chance to go on the night shift and stock shelves. And I did that for a summer. Didn't like that one, working third shift. It was, you know, too much of a, a change, you know. I could never get used to sleeping during the day and working during the night. Uh, then the next one, when I was in college, uh, I worked at Bay City Milling loading trucks. That was a tough job, uh, but it paid really well. You remember the Teamsters, and you're gonna bring it home a hundred bucks or something like that. Again, very good money for a college kid. And uh, so did that, and you know, eventually I, you know, graduated, started teaching, and you know, was a teacher from then on. So throughout all three of those jobs you just mentioned, were there any uh, important lessons you learned? 
Well, you, you certainly learn responsibility. I mean, you have to be there to deliver the papers, you know, in the afternoon at, you know, uh, on the dailies and in the morning, in the, uh, in the weekends, on Sundays. Uh, you know, you had to do your collection. You had a bill that was due. You had to go down to the Bay City Times and pay your bill. And then what was left from your collection, that was your profit. So, yeah, you learn responsibility, you learn how to take care of money and keep track of, you know, who paid, who didn't, who owes what, you know, it's all part of it. Anybody, uh, any influential mentors throughout your career? Uh, yeah, no, not as a, as a paper boy. Uh, I guess in teaching, um, I had a couple very good um I'm trying to think what they call them, not critic teachers. Um, anyways, the teachers I worked under. And this was at Bay City uh, Central High School. And uh, my first one was uh, Bruce Leslie. And, uh, you know, Bruce was real good about bringing in current events topics into his class. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of respect for him. Bruce had a back problem. He had to undergo surgery. And so I was shifted to another uh, teacher named Bill Plum. And he was also very good. I really had a couple good uh, teachers to work under. And uh, so certainly those guys are mentors uh, or were mentors. Neither one is alive today, but uh, good guys. And I kind of kept in touch with them over the years. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to see them. Let's see. So I guess we'll focus more on your, your teaching career at this point. Or, well, I'll actually get to that in a minute. Um, out of any of the positions you had before you attended college, or before you became a teacher, I should say, um, any, were there any more memorable aspects of those positions, like a funny story or just well, somebody you worked with? or You know, I, I liked everybody that I worked with. I think the the uh, important, one of the important aspects of, of any of those jobs was uh, working and getting along with other people. Uh, that, it, just that, I think you learn people skills and they're very important. I mean, that works very well, I guess, no matter what you do. Uh, and uh, just throw this little aside in here, that's one of the things that I think um, is one of the downfalls, yeah, I, if it, or I don't want to call it a downfall, maybe the negative aspect of people who want to homeschool their kids is that you miss that social interaction. And not, not only uh, the friendship angle, but just dealing with other people, you know, because in any setting, whether it be business or education, you're going to run into all kinds of different people with different backgrounds and different personalities. And it's a valuable thing, you know, to be able to just, you know, negotiate your work or social life or whatever uh, with as many people as possible. It's just a, a good, good skill to have. Um, so getting into college. So we know we, you attended Central Michigan University. Yeah, I, I did two years at Delta first. Oh. And uh, yeah, my first year at Delta was not my uh, sterling year for me academically. There was way too much freedom. You know, at, after being uh, in a parochial school where, uh, you know, you're kind of under the thumb, you know, you go to college and you know, there's nobody telling you to go to class, uh, you know, so on and so forth. That kind of abused uh, uh, things at uh, Delta College and got myself in a hole academically that I had to work myself out of. Um, but, you know, again, it, everything um, you learn from every situation, I kind of learned that, you know, you have to tend to business. You know, you can't spend all your time shooting baskets and playing ping pong and you know, hanging out, you got to go to school, <laughs> got to do your homework, you know, go to class, got to do your homework. So I was much better when I got to Central Michigan University. What made you want to transfer to CMU? Uh, well, you know, I still wanted to be a teacher. 
and you know CMU at that time that was kind of like a teacher's college. Also, my girlfriend, uh, who would later be my wife, uh, we had started uh, dating when I was going to Delta, and then she went to Central Michigan. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be nice to be able to go to school at the same school she was, and uh, so yeah, Central was the ideal choice for me for a couple of reasons. Was uh, and teaching education was always your major. Oh, well, it, I I majored in in subjects, but I was in the education program, hmm. so I was uh, you know I I had a double major history and social studies, but I found uh, you know when I graduated there weren't many jobs to be had in those areas, so um, you know I did. Uh, get a job teaching uh, social studies at St. Peter and Paul in Saginaw. But right away, I saw the benefit of, you know, instead of just having a secondary uh, education certificate, to have an elementary one as well. So during the summer months, I started on uh, getting elementary certification. So that after a couple years, I was certified both elementary and secondary, and that just, you know, it expands the job market for you. Any uh, influential mentors in college? Um, you know, not really. I mean, there were there were some professors that I I thought were particularly good, um, but uh, you know, the education classes really didn't prepare you for what you face in the classroom. And uh, yeah, they, they could have done a much better job there. Uh, <laughs> the one thing I kind of remember about um, the education classes is the advice that if you were going to go and drink after work, don't drink in the same city you're teaching. <laughs> go to a neighboring city. <laughs> Why is that? Well, just so you know, you don't run into parents or uh, you know, it, it sometimes could come back and bite you if your parents saw you laughing and having a good time or a little drunk or something like that. You know, it works against you in education. You know, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be conscious of that. And I know I, um, you know, I taught for many years in Essexville and I generally, I never went to the Silver Palace or uh, the uh, Shot and Shell or I'm trying to think Center Road Bar. Any of these things in Essexville, I'm just very conscious of that. Just that, you know, not that there was anything wrong. Or, or even at the St. John's picnic, I wouldn't go and, you know, drink in the beer tent when my students are all running around outside the tent. You know, it's just the, you know, you're when you're a teacher, you, there's a certain, uh, I think, kind of responsibility that I've done nothing wrong with going out and drinking a few beers or anything like that, but I just didn't do it in front of parents or, uh, or my students. Um, in, uh, back in college, did you do anything like, uh, did you do a semester abroad or have any no, particular interests? No, nothing like that. No. Any other interests outside of, outside of college at this time? Well, the music thing has always been strong, and uh, but when you're in college, um, you really didn't have much money uh, to go to a concert or you know go to Detroit or anything like that, and I kind of missed out on uh, the teen nightclub scene in Michigan uh, because that kind of uh, blossomed after I had started going to college. You know, prior to that, there were the Rolaire dances, and we went out there. But after you get into college, you'd say, well, it's a little bit more of a high school scene than uh, a college scene. And uh, so I didn't, I kind of missed out on that, which I'm sorry. And I did, because really, there was, there was some pretty interesting people that came, you know, those teen clubs mm -hmm. that I didn't get a chance to see. Um, so can you, can you talk any, any more about the music scene growing up? For you, in what way? It can, it, can you talk a little bit more about the music scene growing up? Uh, in terms of, uh, well, I guess you know, growing up, it just didn't seem 
it seemed like music was made other places other than Michigan. It wasn't until uh, I bought a couple of Motown records in the 60s and looking at the label that this music was made in Detroit, Michigan. I said, wow, you know, I just didn't, you know, I didn't think that, you know, that this music was being made in this area. And so uh, that probably started me in getting very interested in music being made in Michigan. And then, of course, then later on, you had all these teenage bands after the Beatles had uh, forming groups and playing at the teen clubs and so on. So I was very aware of all that. I, like I said, I didn't get a chance to see a lot of them at the time. But, um, you know, their music was being played on the radio. So it was just kind of a, a fascinating thing that continues to this day. Is probably the roots of doing the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame. Is just my interest in that aspect of Michigan, Michigan culture. Um, so earlier you mentioned that Elvis Presley on TV was kind of your introduction to uh, rock and roll and to music. Were there any other... Uh... Any other pivotal points you think? Well, the that... Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan. That was just, <laughs> that was just really something. And, you know, like, uh, the next day in school, and we were, this was our senior year, and everybody was talking about the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. They had just, I want to hold your hand. It just hit number one. And, you know, we were dancing to it at school dances and then to actually see the Beatles on television. Uh, that was pretty cool. And those, you know, that really cemented their fame in the, the United States, those three appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, so the, the Ed Sullivan, that particular episode of the Ed Sullivan Show, um, the guest right before the Beatles was Terry McDermott. And growing up in Bay City, Essexville, was there a, a sense of pride? Oh, yes, the- definitely. When Terry McDermott came to Bay City, after winning the gold medal, I think we were let out of school early and he appeared down, if I remember correctly, it was right at center in Washington. That, that was, at that time, was where the People's National Bank was. And so we got out and everybody went there to see him and cheered him and everything. That was, uh, it was pretty cool. Did you get to meet him? No, I didn't meet him, never met Terry McDermott. Uh, but I remember him being introduced by Ed Sullivan that night. Uh, you know, he would, if there was a celebrity of some sort in the audience, he would say, and uh, tonight we have in the audience, blah, blah, blah. Well, in this case, it was Terry McDermott. And uh, there's some pretty famous pictures of him backstage, you know, doing some gag photographs like he was cutting the Beatles hair, which was a real big deal. You know, the Beatles' long hair, which, if you look at those pictures, really wasn't very long. But it was a different style than what everybody was typically wearing in America. So it was, uh, it was a big thing. I think to uh, end out the interview, I think we'll take a shift over to your uh, career in education. So tell us about where you taught and how long you taught and maybe some courses you taught too, because I, th- I think you mentioned you. Yeah, I started at St. Peter and Paul, and uh, I had an opportunity uh, that summer to get a job at my old alma mater, uh, which was St. Joseph grade school. Uh, but actually, before that, well, I had signed a contract, and then... Um, I was offered a job at Bay City Central. And I turned it down because I had signed a contract. And I, you know, that's, that's a big thing for me. And signing a contract is like giving your word. And uh, that's always been something. If I give my word, if I say I'm going to do something, then I'm going to do it. Uh, so I turned down the job at Bay City Central. And... Uh, as it turned out, actually, it was a good decision because uh, they underwent a big austerity program, and I would have been pink slipped from uh, Bay City Central for sure if I would have taken that job. So I continued on at St. Joseph, and uh, Lynn and I were married after my first year at St. Joseph, and uh, 
I really enjoyed working there. It, it was a great location. Um, you know, you teach all subjects. So for gym class, uh, sometimes we would go bowling. And we had two bowling alleys, uh, the Empire or Alert at that time, uh, that were within walking distance. And we could go and bowl a game and come back. And, you know, you, you could teach kids how to score, which you're working in math and just doing a fun thing. Also, uh, we could go to movies. And if they had a matinee, it was something that was acceptable for junior high or elementary kids. We could walk to the state or the empire and actually see a movie. Um, so that, that was really cool. We did, uh, you know, looking at some things in the history of Bay City and going downtown and looking at the buildings and the architecture and so on. Uh, you know, that was fun. Sometimes I'd just do that as a visit activity. We're just going to take a walk, go walk downtown, <laughs> take a look at the buildings, look at, look at them in a way that probably you haven't looked at them before. So uh, they had a big stage and a beautiful gym. So I coached uh, fifth and sixth grade basketball there, I did plays. Uh, we did, uh, we did a, a pretty elaborate production of The Hobbit back in the 1970s uh, that I'm, I wish I had a videotape of it, you know, but there weren't any video cameras or anything like that. But the kids really did a good job on that. That was a lot of fun to do. Um, so then, uh, anyways, uh, I left St. Joseph, uh, got a job uh, actually working in Saginaw for Tri-City Sair uh, as a, a, a job instructor you know, kind of teaching people how to um, write a resume, uh, you know, interview skills and so on and so forth. Worked with a lot of minority people at that time, which was, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a good experience, to say the least. Then a job opened up uh, at uh, Essexville Hampton as a reading consultant, and I had uh, some training in that area. So uh, I started on that and spent... 28 years at, uh, at Kramer Junior High, which was also a great experience. You know, it was a really good school district to work at. Um, you want to talk about your uh, rock and roll history course? Well, uh, I started that actually at, uh, at uh, Kramer Junior High in Essexville. They were looking for a, um, an elective. And uh, my friend, a uh, friend of mine and myself had been doing these rock and roll trivia shows, kind of like multimedia rock and roll trivia shows uh, in Bay City. And I just threw out the idea. I, I think I could teach a, a rock and roll history class, not thinking really that they were going to buy this, but they did. And uh, that summer, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had a one week um, teacher training session called So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Teacher. And uh, so I went to that on my own expense, spent a week uh, down there uh, in Ohio, and each day we would go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for half the day and uh, then do other learning activities. Now you could incorporate rock and roll music into your classroom. And uh, so that, that it kind of got me into uh, writing because... There was no textbook, and so I had to put together for the rest of the summer kind of a book that I could use in the class and how I would incorporate music with that, use cassette tapes, and, uh, you know, start it right there. And, uh, you know, from that point on, I, I worked in, I did that class, uh, went through two or three different textbooks, expanding it and so on. And after I retired, just passed it off to another teacher who was also very good uh, and a good friend of mine. And she continued it on for, I think, another 12 years or something like that. So, uh, uh, you know, that after I retired, uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute uh, heard about the website that I was developing for called Michigan Rock and Roll Legends on the history of Michigan Rock and Roll invited me to start teaching out there, which I, I did. Uh, I did that for 19 years out at uh, 
on campus at SVSU. Also uh, uh, did some classes at Rutgers University in, uh, in New Jersey since we spent a good deal of time there because of our son lives there and our grandkids are there. So, uh, you know, and here we are at the museum and uh, uh, Mike Bashigalupo gave me the opportunity of bringing the Hall of Fame to the Historical Museum of Bay County. And so uh, I started curating it and I'm still doing that right now. All right. Um, before we close out, anything, any other topics or points in your life you want to discuss or... I don't know. I think we covered everything, didn't we? Did we <laughs> leave so. anything out? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been Gary Johnson, uh, and uh, thank you very much. All right. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. <laughs>